Well, last weekend, Oregon had a big lineup of visitors on campus, and that could soon result in Oregon's 2024 recruiting class getting a bump. Here we go. You are Locked On Ducks, your daily podcast on the Oregon Ducks, part of the Locked On Podcast Network, your team every day. Yes, it is that time once again for Locked On Ducks. I'm your host, Spencer McLaughlin. Thank you so much for making this your first listen or your first view of the day. Part of the Locked On Podcast Network, your team every day and your number one source to stay up to date with the Ducks. If you haven't already, like, comment, subscribe, rate, review, please and thank you wherever you listen to or watch the show. Today, we got my man Max Torres. He covers the Ducks for Fan Nation at Sports Illustrated. He's a recurring guest on the show. He's the host of the Ducks Dish podcast. And there's only one of those titles that is the most prestigious honor you could have, and that's recurring guest here at Locked on Ducks, obviously. So, Max, it's great to have you back, my man. How is the recruiting grind going for you? Glad to be back, Spencer. Uh, man, it's, uh, it's a busy one. Um, you know, just because things are kind of winding down visit-wise in, uh, in Eugene, as we head into a dead period here, I mean, the, the scoop, the intel, like those are always are the interviews – those are always, uh, you know, at the top of the priority list. Uh, I got one right before we hopped on here that we'll probably mention. Um, but yeah, it's it's busy as can be, and I'm heading into a little vacation before long, so trying to ramp it up before I hit the road. Max, you're one of our recruiting guys here at the show. You can't take a vacation. <laughs> that's that's not a that's not allowed. You you can take a vacation when the season starts. How about that? That's, that's when you can, you, and by vacation, I mean you can vacation to Autzen Stadium to see how the visits go that we have during uh, during the season. But anyway, now that I've made Max feel bad about himself and his utter lack of work ethic to begin the show, let's talk about what Oregon has been doing recently on the recruiting trail. Lots of good stuff, but the news, as you alluded to, isn't, isn't falling just yet. It's not happening at this point in time. You had Ryan Pelham, of course, choose... USC over the Ducks, but I think once that dead period starts, which I believe is like the whole month of July, basically, we're going to start seeing some some commits start to, to roll in for the Ducks even further in their 2024 cycle, which is currently eighth in the country as uh, we record this show. Still has room to go up, Max, but last weekend they, they had a really, really impressive lineup, again, of, of visitors rolling through who, if they pick up a couple commits from that group of kids... They could see their 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 eighth best recruiting class in in the country right now go up even further than that. Yeah, it was the the biggest weekend of the month uh, for Oregon, and you know that didn't result in any immediate commitments, which uh, I think I was kind of surprised with, as were probably a lot of Duck fans. But we're seeing some top guys that were on campus uh, set their decision dates, so they're moving along their process. Um, and this was the weekend that uh, everybody kind of had bookmarked or circled on their calendar, if you will, as these top recruits started to lock in their official visits back in the spring a couple months ago. And, um, you know, lots of uh, lots of buzz coming out of that weekend that uh, Dan Lanning and his coaching staff uh, are, you know, making all the right moves. Yeah, and the moves that, that they're making haven't yet come to fruition yet, as, as we mentioned, but we expect that to happen pretty soon. So let's run through the lineup of guys who were on campus last week whose names you definitely want to have on your radar if you're one of those many many Oregon fans out there who follow the the recruiting beat and follow class rankings and commitments and all that sort of stuff so they had Juwan McCroy a four-star offensive tackle who's from the same hometown as a Bo Nix that'd be Pinson Alabama they had Braden Platt four-star linebacker who is down to Oregon UCLA and Oklahoma are kind of the leaders there he visited recently. He's from Yelm, Washington, best defensive player in the state in in the 2024 cycle. Yeah, number one number one guy on on the defensive side of the ball there. For those listening on podcast, Max nodded his head in agreement because he knows that that is correct. He was like a like a little bobblehead over there, just like yes, that is true. Okay. Um, sometimes I'm just in a mood when I come on to do shows, and you all just have to put up with it because I'm what you got. So, uh, Dewan Riggs or Dejon Riggs three-star running back from Washington, D.C., 
Kamar Mathudi, guy that you've covered for uh, a quite quite a long time, Max, four-star linebacker from Valley Village, California. Aiden Breland is kind of the biggest name they had on campus last weekend, five-star defensive lineman from Modern Day, where Oregon already has one commit in uh, Jack Rig or Jack Wrestler, not Riggs, Jack Wrestler, the wide receiver, three-star from there. And a couple more, uh, Jeremiah McClellan, four-star wideout from the St. Louis area, who's got Ohio State and LSU after him. And then Siona Laulea, the three-star Juco cornerback from the College of San Mateo in, in California. So those are a lot of big names. They've got a lot of star power. They've got, you know, a, a really, really good number of, of 24-7 composite ratings there. And if you get just, I think, a couple of these guys to commit, you know, sometime, it, it, they all have different timelines and such, but... If you get a couple of those names, this number eight class, I think, especially if you can get Aiden Breland, gosh, that'd be great. I'm always here for five-star defensive linemen. Then the class could could really, really take another step forward. Yeah, the, these were, you know, the names that you listed off were, were some of the biggest visitors that the Ducks saw this past weekend. I think you hit on all the, the really big names uh, in the 24 class. Um, you know, we can kind of start chipping away at some of them. Is that is that kind of what you were hoping yeah, to do? Yeah, yeah, let's, yeah, let's do it. Okay, um, so yeah, how about we we talk about Jaquan McRoy from Pinson, Alabama, Clay Chalkville High School. Um, he is one of the top offensive line targets for Elite Terry here in the 24 class. Um, the reason I wanted to start with him is because he is set to announce his college commitment on Saturday, July 1st. Um, so that's kind of the, the big priority guy that we kind of shift our attention to as uh, the Ducks come out of the weekend. And, you know, we're kind of seeing where the, the dominoes start to fall. Um, and uh, he's going to be choosing from a top four of Oregon, Kentucky, Arkansas, and Ole Miss. Took official visits to all of his finalists in the month of June. Uh, I logged my pick for Oregon to, to Land McCroy back in May, and, and I don't have any reason to move off of that pick now as we head into the decision. Coming out of the weekend, I probably only feel more confident, um, if, if anything, uh, that, that Elite Terry is going to be looking at pretty much his biggest recruiting win since he got to Oregon, unless you want to talk about uh, Nishad Strouther. Uh, out of East Carolina. He was a big guy out of the portal. Um, but I think that McCroy would be a massive pull for Terry, seeing that he's coming out of the state of Alabama. Those guys from the Southeast are never easy to get. Um, but that that's kind of one guy that I think you definitely have to have your attention on. Um, and then I'll talk about one more guy, and then we can kind of go back and forth a little bit. Spencer, um, Dejon Riggs out of Washington, D.C., St. John's. Um, I don't think he's released the tops right now but he is set to make his college commitment on monday july 3rd and uh, i really like where oregon stands in that recruitment you know I, I talked to him after that visit and he mentioned he was having a lot of really good conversations with dan lanning will stein carlos lachlan um you have a couple other schools that are in the mix there namely pitt and uh minnesota but uh carlos lachlan is an elite relationship builder and, um, you know, he's he's right up there with the best of them when it comes to recruiting the running back position. You saw Christian Clark out of uh, Arizona, another top target for Oregon. This class at running back commit to Texas recently. So that's kind of shrinking Oregon's pool. Um, so I like McCroy. I feel really good about Oregon's chances to land rigs heading into that decision. And then uh, we'll kind of go from there and see what the running back picture is looking like, because there's still a couple of big names they're uh, tracking there. Yeah, I, I think we've done nothing but build up uh, trust, confidence, and admiration for Carlos Lachlan at this point in time. I mean, his one season, he brings in Bucky Irving and Noah Whittington. Yeah, yeah, they're, they're, they're studs. He goes out and recruit Dante Dowdell. Yeah, that looks like it's going to be a really, really good addition to the room. He snags Jaden Lamar, another four-star guy as well. And running back, interestingly enough, Max, is the only offensive position that Oregon does not have a commitment from in the 2024 class. They've got a pair of quarterbacks. They've got offensive linemen. They've got a tight end. They've got a, a couple wide receivers in there, but they don't have a, a running back yet. So I'm definitely curious to see when when that domino falls. But th there are a lot of dominoes for, for the Ducks that haven't fallen yet. Some will go to Oregon. Some will not. Remember, we're not going to get all of these kids. We're trying to get as many a, as we can get the classes as high as possible. But amongst those visitors, there's one name that stands out to me uh, above the rest that I would really like Oregon to get for for the obvious reason and then uh, another reason as well. Now, the reason that you should go check out FanDuel is because it's America's number one sports book, and you can take your first swing at betting Major League Baseball on FanDuel and get 10 times your first bet amount in bonus bets up to $200. That's right. Just bet 20 bucks and you'll land 200 
hundred dollars in bonus bets, win or lose. That's two hundred you can spend betting everything from the money line to the over under to who you think is going to hit the first home run. All that on an app that's safe, secure, and super easy to use. Plus, when you win, you can get paid instantly. There's no better place to get in on Major League Baseball action than FanDuel, America's number one sports book. Sign up today. Visit FanDuel.com slash locked on. Get up to $200 in bonus bets. That's FanDuel.com slash locked on. FanDuel, official partner of Major League Baseball. That was a badly needed second segment sip. I got to be honest with you all. That was that was some dry, dry mouth run in there. But guess what? We're good to go. So the name that stands out to me most amongst that visitor list from last weekend, Max, is Aiden Breland. And that reasoning for me is twofold. Number one, he's a five-star defensive lineman. Plays on, on the interior. Anytime you have a five-star name out there, it's going to catch everybody's attention. I think that's the obvious reason. But the other reason, Max, is when you look at what the interior of this defensive line is currently scheduled to look like going into next year, you do have a bunch of blue chip prospects in, in the 2023 class who you know are, are going to have the opportunity to earn playing time. Guys like Johnny Bowens or Terrence Green, Amari Washington, Ashton Porter maybe, right? But Breland, I think, still would have the opportunity. He's the caliber of player that can play as a true freshman. I think we're going to see, see that with Mateo this year. And a lot of times, you know, four-star kids don't even end up seeing the field for, for Oregon. You rarely see that with with a five-star sort of sort of player. So I think there's still an element of mystery with, uh, you know, some of those guys who certainly have great upsides. Davian Sims, uh, certainly another name to, to watch for on the defensive line going into next season. But I just think positionally, Oregon after this year is going to lose Brandon Dorless, Popo Amavai, Taki Taimani, Casey Rogers. Those are your top four interior defensive linemen there. And that's a lot to replace after the season. And I think a foundational piece like Breland is capable of being could be a really, really good thing for uh, not, not just Oregon's recruiting class, but I think it's easy also to get caught up in the weeds of like, oh, we want to have a really, really good recruit, recruiting class. Well, you want to have a good class because you want to be able to put together a good roster. And I think Breland would kind of be at a position where you want to have depth, you want to have talent. And you need some foundational pieces when you're losing guys like Dorless and, and and Casey Rogers and the like. Yeah, Aiden Breland is uh you know the, the biggest name when it comes to defensive linemen uh, on the West Coast here in the 2024 class. And uh, it's worth noting that Oregon already has some momentum at that position. Of course, this cycle with Tioni Gray uh, coming out of the the Missouri St. Louis area, um, I believe. And then you also have Zadavian Sims out of Oklahoma. So they have some pieces in place already. And I know that they'd love to combine those guys with Aiden Breland, um, you know, 6'5", 290, you know, certainly a guy that you could see playing at 300 pounds, probably in the college at the college level. Uh, I've been around Breland quite a bit in Southern California, you know, making it out to some of the Trinity League schools like Modern Day and St. John Bosco. And, you know, throughout last season, I never really felt like Oregon was too much of a threat for Aiden Breland, you know, not really that involved, you know, they're going to try, but I didn't see them as like a really good option for him necessarily. But by the time the spring showcase rolled around for modern day uh, it, last month, you know, Oregon had come on pretty strong in this recruitment. And um, now that they got him out for an official visit, I think that, you know, them being a realistic player in this recruitment is, is only becoming, uh, you know, more pronounced or more apparent um, you know, trying to speak with some folks around uh, the program in Eugene. Um, I think that they feel good about their chances for Aiden Breland, but this is going to be a fight for sure. Um, the Ducks did get the last official visit, at least in June. I don't think he's going to be making it out for any more official trips this month um, or maybe even before he makes his decision. Uh, that said, there are some big schools that are in the mix here as well. In addition to Oregon, you got Georgia, Texas A&M and Miami as some of the main contenders. Uh, he also took officials out to all of those schools. So I think that there's reason to be confident for Oregon because of, um, you know, the staff that they have, Lanning, Lapoy, Tuioti, who probably doesn't get mentioned enough in the grand scheme of things with recruiting. Um, certainly with the improved play last year, I think that was great. And it's only going to be better this year. But Breland, uh, the last I spoke with him, which I think was in May, he was still looking to make his decision, I think, late summer, early season. Um, so with, with wrestler in the fold, you already have some momentum at modern day. And then you're also going after guys like Brandon Baker and Nate Frazier. So I think Oregon's got as realistic a shot as anybody with Aiden Breland, but they're going to have to keep battling. And then 
hopefully try to get him back on campus if they can before a decision, if that is indeed coming in the late summer. Yeah, and Oregon's still chasing their first five-star commit in, in the 2024 cycle. And, you know, you and I have talked before on the show about how many they could end up landing. And I feel like, you know, the two that they brought in this year, Mateo Uyunglele and Jurion Dickey, I feel like that's kind of the, the, the baseline expectation for, for five-star recruits in a given cycle, given the, the tone and tenor and just the standard that this staff is is setting on that front. Because they brought in two, but had Dillingham not left, you would have had a third with Dante Moore. And then there was the whole Peyton Bowen debacle, which, you know, we had him, didn't have him, yada, yada, yada. But like, they were on the cusp of having four, still ended up with two. So I just look at, you know, where this class sits right now, eighth nationally in the country. And I say, look, I, I see no reason this class can't catapult themselves back inside the top five. A guy like Breland can help with that. There are a lot of other, you, you know, pick your favorite five-star name. Uh, we'll, we'll talk about some more on tomorrow's show with, with, with Brian Smith for all you everydayers out there. But whether it's Brandon Baker or Colin, Colin Simmons or Williams Nuer, Nueneri, dang it. Rushing. Uh, uh, yeah, Eli- yeah, Elijah Rushing too. Um, but I almost had Nuaneri's name like down to the point where I never messed it up, and then I messed it up, and now I'm most upset with myself, and I have to start. I'm like Homer Simpson. I going up days since mispronouncing Williams Nuaneri's name, back to zero, and we got to we got to start over on that front. But anyway, so I think there's still a lot of room to grow in in this class on that front. Now Oregon has to keep their pedal to the metal, right? They they've got to you know, stay committed, stay grinding and, and get these big time names. But I look at where the class is sitting right now. And I think that it's far more likely that it goes up than it is that it goes down in terms of a national recruiting ranking. I don't think it's impossible that it could go down necessarily, but it just kind of feels to me. And I'm curious as to your thoughts to this, that it, it's, it's an 80, 20 feel that it's going to be an upward moving class as time goes on. Yeah, I mean, I, I feel like you could even move the confidence up to like 90 for that um, just because of the guys that are set to announce their decisions and, you know, kind of how my, how confident I feel that Oregon can really add a bunch of these top tier guys. Um, you know, I've, I've been rolling out some prediction stories over on Ducks Digest, which I don't do lightly. Um, I think I, I wish I had one of those little features on my site, like a crystal ball or something where I could just do that and it'd be a little bit easier, but yeah, I think just with the make one the, on like clip art or something, and just you know put it put it in there. Yeah, I, I don't I don't know how to how that all works. I don't have the me the neither. Design but you know it sounded good. It did. It did. It's it's promising. <laughs> um, but yeah, I think just with with the the work that they've put in, um, you know, you're seeing a lot of these other schools pop off on the recruiting trail. You know, USC, Washington, Stanford, uh, Wazoo even got some commits. I think Utah got one maybe recently i think possibly Dude, stanford oh. is crazy stanford's like i mean they're, they're taking everybody right now which is interesting because of their academic requirements i'd be curious how that factors in or if that how much of a hurdle that is for yeah, troy taylor can, can we just for like 60 seconds give props to troy taylor and what Definitely. he's doing on the recruiting trail right now because this is not an easy thing today stanford cannot bring in transfer portal kids so they have to be really good recruiting at the high school ranks and it's not as if they haven't recruited well before because for all those kids out there who are you know good prospects and truly value an education there are not a lot of schools that can match the 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 shine or the appeal of a stanford education but it has been a hurdle for them on more than one occasion everybody knows that and stanford is currently the number 11 class in the country according to 24 7 elijah brown was kind of the first big domino to fall but they have six four-star players and and 17 three stars that is a that is a radical one one year turnaround i know this is a ducks podcast but that's just i I mean frankly i would love for be stanford for for stanford to be really really good again and be one of the biggest brands in in the pac-12 because i think it's fun but you know what dan lanning is doing at oregon yes it is great it is impressive but what troy taylor is doing at stanford right now that is mighty mighty difficult yeah no it definitely is so i've i've Definitely want to make sure I give him his props. Elijah Brown is one of my favorite quarterbacks that I've been able to cover since I've been out here in Southern California. Really love that fit for him in Palo Alto. Um, you know, the, the I almost said Ducks, the Cardinal uh, got a quarterback from my neck of the woods with Long Beach Millikins, Miles Jackson last year. Really like him too. So that that program is definitely on the uh, on the rise. 
Um, I'm, I'm trying to think if there's anybody else that, that we were supposed to talk about. I mean, you're, it's your show, so it, I just want to make sure we get all this stuff, well, get the, all the things that you want. Yeah, wanted. I mean, the the other guy that I really wanted to ask you about was Jeremiah McClellan, the four-star wideout from, from St. Louis, because with the Tysier Denmark flip to Penn State, did that become official, by the way? Did yeah. he? Yeah, okay. Because initially it was, it was the reports were that he – uh, had flipped away from Oregon, was going to flip to Penn State, but hadn't yet flipped or committed to Penn State. Anyway, yada, yada, yada. So you lose Tysier Denmark, who was one of your earlier uh, commits in, in the class. I wonder how much of a priority it is for, for Lanning or Marshall Malkow or Junior Adams or anybody else involved with the recruitment to almost re- re- replace that that loss of Denmark and say we'd really like to you know get another receiver body there and they added you know Dylan Gresham uh, in, in addition to Riggs but McClellan is a guy who's got Ohio State after him Brian Hartline is what the best wide receiver wide receiver recruiter in the history of the sport like am I like am, am, am I overstating things here at Ohio uh, State I don't think so yeah I mean I I don't know if I'd say recruiter just because he hasn't um, – I feel like he hasn't been a college coach quite long enough. I mean, developer, I feel like you could, pro- you could definitely throw that tag on him. I'm just trying to think of some other big-name wide receiver coaches. I know Brian McClendon when he was at Oregon and Georgia, South Carolina, you know, he did a good job. Um, I want to say Gaddis. He's been, the wide receiver receiver he's, guy? he's been the wide receivers coach since 2018. And in that time, he's had Garrett Wilson – Chris Olave, Jackson Smith and Jigba, who's now on my Seahawks, and I think is going to be a stud. Marvin Harrison Jr. and who am I missing? There, there, mm. there's, there's a, there's a fifth one. There's a fifth one in it's, there. That's but, already in the league. Yeah, or that, or that is super, super good. Ibuka, Ibuka is pretty I'm good. At, yeah, Ameka Ibuka also really good. Like it's just crazy the room that he's put together there. But, the, but again, goes to the value of having good position coaches and what they can do for your team and for your roster. And that's why, you know, we talk about the value of the assistance that Dan Lanning has hired and the need for him to continually make good hires when other coaches move on or, you know, take a a bigger, more involved job, right? If Carlos Lachlan became an offensive coordinator one day, uh, that'd be a big loss on, on the recruiting front because we see what he does. And if Brian Hartline ever left Ohio State, th- that might be a loss for them on the recruiting front because he clearly knows how to recruit the wide receivers. But anyway, bringing this back to McClellan, I brought all that up to say it's going to be tough to get him, but do you get the sense that Oregon kind of has that that feel on him with regards to, hey, we'd really like to get this guy because we thought we were going to get this other kid and he ended up going somewhere else? Yeah, so, so with Jeremiah McClellan, you know, things have definitely gone up a notch, you know, in the last week or so. Um, I got to talk to him at the OT7 championship in um, Huntington Beach uh, a couple weeks ago um, and see him in person. I mean, that, that dude's nice. He's he's real smooth with it. Um, and he also has that frame that I think, uh, you know, supports just, you know, like going over the middle and just kind of the direction of the sport. Um, I think he's kind of, you know, a bigger bodied receiver from that regard. But basically the latest I'm hearing on Jeremiah McClellan is that it's kind of come down to three. Um, you got Oregon, LSU, and Ohio State all in the mix. All of those schools got official visits. Missouri's kind of trying to hang on there by a thread, I think, on the outside looking in, if you can be on the outside looking in as the in-state school. Um, so with, with McClellan, um, he was in Eugene for, for uh, his official visit this past weekend, and, and I had a source tell me that him – Michael Van Buren and Jordan Anderson, uh, a pair of Oregon commits, were tied at the hip almost um, this past weekend, just in terms of really hitting it off, you know, building those relationships. Jordan Anderson told me at OT7 when I saw him that he thinks they were they were going to be able to seal the deal going into that official visit with Jeremiah McClellan. Um, and this is where you see, like you were saying, it really helps that Oregon has a lot of guys committed already uh, on offense, particularly two quarterbacks. Um, and then they also have some momentum at receiver. So I know this was a really important trip for McClellan's family, just kind of getting a better feel for Eugene, the atmosphere around campus, what have you. Um, so now it really feels like Jeremiah McClellan is a very realistic option for Oregon. You know, you, you can't really ask for any bigger schools to go against than Ohio State and LSU for wide receivers, unless you want to throw Alabama and, and Georgia in the mix, maybe Florida as well. You know, we can debate that, whatever. But Oregon's in the thick of it. And, um, I mean, I'm not going to predict Jeremiah McClellan to Oregon right now, but I would not be shocked if he did end up a duck when all was said and done 
as far as what's next. Um, you know, he's kind of uh, up in the air about taking uh, another trip to Missouri, uh, which makes me think that uh, the trips are pretty much wrapped up. And, and now he's working on, um, you know, shifting into decision mode and, and wrapping his process up. Before we get to a mailbag question to end today's show, I have just noticed something here on YouTube that I can guarantee, at the very least, I know my guy Bud, who is an everydayer out there, has noticed this. I'm sure some of you noticed this as well. It didn't occur to me until literally about 30 seconds ago. But I realized for this final bullet point that we have here on our rundown for the on today show part of this graphic you see, I have inserted an extra U into the word recruiting. And we're not going to go back and re-record the show because Max's time is tremendously valuable and I wouldn't make him do that. I can almost guarantee that by the time I am realizing this, in your watching or listening to the show, one of you at least has already pointed it out on YouTube or via my Twitter DMs. I appreciate you doing that in advance. Continue to hold me accountable for my grammar incompetence. Now, let's get to a mailbag question. Uh, this came from uh, Lizel. Is the window on getting top recruits going to start closing if Oregon does not make it to the Pac-12 championship or make it to the playoffs this year? I will start with a short answer here, Max. My answer is no. And the only place you need to look to know that is Texas A&M because especially in the world of NIL, you can recruit at a high level and not have those results match on the field, but still be able to recruit. Texas A&M coming off of... Now, now on-field results certainly help. Don't get me wrong. They can't do anything but allow your recruiting profile to increase, which makes it a chicken or the egg problem. But Texas A&M doesn't have a top 10 class this year. They do, however, in the 2024 cycle have a top 25, excuse me, top 25 class, and they're off a of five and seven season. So recruiting is about a lot of different factors. Winning on the field is a factor, but not the only one. But Max, what do you think? Yeah, I mean, yeah, if uh, if not winning on the field and getting really good recruits, like if you were looking for a poster child, A&M would probably be that poster child. Texas um, counts, by the way. Texas you could counts. also talk about Miami. I mean, they haven't been doing really well, and look at how they're doing. Um, yep. you know, I know Oregon fans are probably happy to see that, but no, I mean, yeah, you're, you're, you're right on with that. I don't think that you need to get back to the Pac-12 title game or the playoff to continue contending for elite recruits. That said, does it make your job harder if you don't win? Absolutely. I mean, you're going to have to answer questions. You know, I'm sure the staffs had to answer questions about, Hey, what happened uh, against Washington and Oregon state there, uh, where things kind of completely fell apart, um, uh, late in those games, but whatever, um, so yeah, I don't, th I think that Oregon is, is always going to be in the conversations. They're one of the most iconic brands in college sports. Um, you know, uh, what else? I mean, the, the, as long as you have a coaching staff that prioritizes recruiting like Dan Lanning and this staff have, which I feel like Rob Mullins knows is so important in the event that they need to look for a new coach, they're always going to be right there in the mix of it in the thick of it. Um, but man, there's no program that could benefit more from winning a national championship in, in so many ways, especially recruiting than Oregon. I mean, that would, you could, you could see, like, I'm just picturing it. How sick would it be if Oregon had recruits posing with a national title trophy in their, on their photo shoots? Like that would just be unbelievable. And it's that something that be, they can't do right now. That would be great for a number of reasons. Yes. The recruiting would likely get, get a bump there, but Perhaps most significantly, Max, it means we would have won the national championship, which would... I can't even put that into words, see? And that's what I do all day is I put stuff into words. That that would be... Like, the recruiting bump would be notable, but I got to be honest, that would be like 10th on my list of reasons why I would really, really like that to happen. Because there are a lot of other reasons as, as to why. And also in the 2023 cycle, just for reference, uh, to, to kind of further answer your question here, Lizel, uh Miami finished seventh in the country despite uh, having a 5-7 and seven record. And Texas A&M finished 15th in the 2023 recruiting cycle. Also had a 5-7 and seven record a year ago. So it helps. It gives you an extra boost, but is not inherently the prerequisite. Stanford 2024, another uh, another great example for all that sort of stuff because they were terrible last year. But real bad. They they have the next modern day quarterback 
committed. Like the previous ones were these guys named Bryce Young, uh, Matt Leinart once upon a time, Matt Barkley went there. Like the list of modern day quarterbacks is rather impressive. And for Stanford Ave, that is, uh, is pretty, pretty darn good. But Oregon in a, in a very, very good spot. Excited to see what happens and excited for the next time we can get my man Max Torres here on the show. He's at M Torres Sports on Twitter. He's a great follow over there. Super tapped in on the recruiting show. That's why we brought him on the show today. He's the host of the Ducks Dish podcast, covers Oregon for Fan Nation at Sports Illustrated. And his most prestigious honor, a frequent guest of the show. Max, thanks as always, man. Appreciate you having me on, Spencer. Always uh, fun to talk some ducks and uh, should be a fun one on the recruiting trail these next couple weeks. It always is. I appreciate everyone listening. I will see you next time. Have a wonderful rest of your day and go ducks.